Jesus, we want to thank you. Thank you for your steadfast love, your unfailing mercy, your irreplaceable sacrifice, and your magnificent grace.
sweetest name I know. What a beautiful song. Good morning. I feel like I've been gone forever. <laughs> it's really good to be back. I hope that you all are happy to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Would you stand with me, please? Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blessings you have bestowed on us. We thank you for this church family, for all of these people that are here today that are here to worship. Receive our worship and praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Wonderful grace of Jesus. Wonderful grace of Jesus, greater than all my sin. How shall my tongue describe it? Where shall its praise begin? Taking away my burden, setting my spirit free. Oh, the wonderful grace of Jesus reaches me. Wonderful the master's grace of Jesus, deeper more than all the mighty sea, higher than the mountain, sparkling like a fountain, all sufficient grace for you and me than the scope of my transgression, greater far than all my sin and shame, oh magnify the precious name of Jesus, praise his name, wonderful grace of
when my eyes shall close in death, when I soar to worlds unknown, see thee on my judgment throne, rock of ages, clap for me, let me communion hymn this morning, There is a Redeemer. When the church gathers, some come who have had their hopes crushed in the last year. A job may have been lost, perhaps a home or a relationship has been lost. Various ones might have lost a battle for good health, a loved one, or basic self-respect. Most tragically, there may be some who have lost faith. If the negative and despair of our world may have finally won the day and there may seem to be no more reason for hope. As we gather around the Lord's table, we find hope. The author of Hebrews advises us, let us hold fast to the confessions of our hope without wavering, 
for he who has promised is faithful. Hebrews 10, 23. The Lord's Supper is a remembrance of what Christ has done for us. It points us to his sacrifice on the cross that makes the forgiveness of our sins a reality. It leads us to fellowship with him, for he has promised to be with us when we gather. We have a hope that is not yet founded in fantasy, but on historical events. When we eat the loaf and drink the cup, we enter the fellowship of the believers who have celebrated this meal faithfully for nearly 2,000 years. As we come to the meal, may we think of the millions who have found relief from the harsh realities of life around the table of the Lord. May we remember that our God is always faithful. May our hope and faith not waver, but be strengthened. May we go from the table strengthened and refreshed and able to ensure another great, another year of life. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for giving us, uh, or thank you for dying on the cross for our sins. Please make sure as we go into communion that everybody will remember why we celebrate the, why we do communion, that, that you died on the cross to save us from our sins. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.
Let's all rise to honor God's word. I'll be reading <clears throat> from James chapter 3, verses 13 through 18. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy, now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Let's pray. Heavenly Father God, we just thank you for your inspiration from your words. We ask you to bless Brother Tim as he brings forth your book to us today and to help us in this service in the coming week. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Good morning. Glad you're here today. I'm glad to be here today. We were gone uh, last Sunday. A friend of ours uh, afforded us the opportunity to be in Branson for the week, and uh, we uh, enjoyed that very much. Annette and I and Jesse were there, and then the girls and their husbands and their kids uh, came and stayed a few days as well. And uh, as we were leaving, Jesse said, Dad, I... I don't mean this negative, but I don't think I want to have kids. And uh, so um, a seven-year-old, two, three-year-old boys and a, a five-month-old baby did him in. But uh, it was good, and uh, we appreciated the opportunity. Turn to the book of James, if you will. I had debated whether we'd finish up the last little bit of uh, Hebrews or whether we'd just move on. And uh, as you can tell, I chose, uh, we went on to James. So if you will turn there, James addresses this book to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. Um, historically, Old Testament, as you look at that, you, many of you are familiar that it came after the exodus that they entered the promised land. They had a time there. There was great unfaithfulness. And uh, God, in his loving discipline, allowed them to be carried away, to be taken and dispersed among the nations. Their captors had the practice of, of when they would conquer a nation that they would send a little pocket of people to each different town and they would spread them out. And that way, sadly, in many cases, their culture would die, their heritage would die, their, their individual history would die, and those people were not as likely to rebel against the conquering government because they had been divided and dispersed. And that is what had happened to God's children, the Jewish people, the Hebrew nation, and they had been carried off. But they had a glue, a bond that kept them, the promises of God, the history that they had in God. But as uh, James addresses this letter, He's acknowledging that this is to people who are spread all over throughout the world. And I was mindful of that as I started reading through that, that that's our situation. Uh, not that we're um, historically Jewish, but that as God's children, we are scattered among the nations. That you and I live, conduct ourselves, go to work, uh, have activity and life, and we are constantly interacting with people who do not have the same mindset that we do. Not that they don't have the same value to God that we do, but they have a very different mindset, a very different way of going about and ordering their lives. And you and I interact with that every day. People whose priorities are very different than our own people whose perspective on things that are happening in the world are very different. I have a friend. Some of you may have seen it on Facebook. I have a friend. 
who is a friend, but he has a very definite, uh, definite, different way of looking at the world. And so he asked me about this NFL football player that was hit and had the cardiac arrest and, and how that brought the nation together in, in a way to pray for him. And he asked me a question. But his way of perceiving that event, that man's injury and near-death experience, versus the way I view it, is very different. Because I have a faith in a loving, active, powerful, wise God. And he pretty much feels like we're in this on our own. We could help one another, but basically we're in this on our own. And you and I interact with people who see the world very differently. Their belief system is not the same as ours. Their faith is not the same as ours. Their way of having peace, their way of having joy, their way of thinking that life is good completely differs from ours. And that does, as the Bible says, make us strangers and aliens in this world. We are different than the people around us. And how difficult it would have been, Old Testament, for those people who had been carried away, carried away from the synagogue, carried away from temple worship, excuse me, from temple worship, carried away from the sacrificial system, from the priesthood, from the teaching of the law, and taken off to a far spot, a kind of a desolate post, and just left to fend for themselves and for their faith among a people who were very different than themselves. So as James writes this, he's writing to encourage those people. You're out there in the real world. You're bumping shoulders with people who are very different than you are, who may think that you're just a little bit strange. And for you to act the way you do does not make any sense to them. And he speaks this word of encouragement. In James, it particularly has to do with trials and hardship. Because James acknowledges it's not that you're just out there living your life among strangers. You're having a hard time living your life among strangers. They were enduring all different kinds of difficulty and trials. And he's telling them, he starts off, uh, I quote this often, I do it, I'm sadly, probably sarcastically. Somebody will call me and say, well, here's this big problem and here's this mess that you need to clean up or solve or whatever. And I will come back and say, well, count it all joy, you know. But that's actually what James says. He says, when you're facing a trial, when you're facing a difficulty, when your perseverance has to kick in and you have to endure, decide to count that as joy. And then he gives them the reason. He says, because God exists and he's at work. This is not randomly happening to you in a, a, some foreign uh, disconnect from any meaning. This is happening to you for a reason. Okay, did God cause it or did God allow? Either way, God's in it and you're in it. And he said he would never leave you or forsake you. And so as we face trials and hardship, we're not supposed to deny that it's hard. We don't have to pretend that it's fun. But we have this abiding joy within us that says, I have a God who doesn't leave me or forsake me. And I'm going to be able to find joy as I move through this difficulty. And James goes on and says, actually, as you come through that trial, as you come through that difficulty, when you pop out on the other side, you'll be a little more mature. You'll be a little more complete. Because God will have accomplished a purpose in your life by your trusting in him. By your choosing to find joy as you move through it, God is going to be glorified and you're going to be built. You're going to be a little closer, a little more like Jesus because of the hardship you went through. Uh, through and because of once again, you proved, you found out God's faithful. 
You know, the scripture says he'll never leave us or forsake us. Uh, I often think of that passage where uh, David, near the end of his life, says, I once was young, but now I'm old, but I've never seen the righteous forsaken. And he has this testimony. David, in his life, had that testimony. I, I've watched. God's faithful to his people. It's his character. He's good, even when things aren't. You know, that scripture and I, that we mention often that God works all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. It doesn't say all things are good, but God is good. And God works all things together for his good. And we go through hard things, trials, real difficulties. Jesus, when he was teaching, it's recorded for us in Matthew chapter 13, Jesus gives the parable about the wheat and the tares. And the parable is that a, a man, uh, a farmer, had fallen asleep, and, and during his sleep, his enemy had come and sowed weeds, tares, among the wheat. And so instead of having a maximum potential crop, instead of having it perfect and uh, impressing the fellow neighbor farmers with how good your, how straight your rows are or whatever, Instead, there's going to be wheat, and there's going to be weeds. And the point is, and Jesus teaches, you got to leave them there together. There will be a time when they're pulled up. There will be a time when they're sorted. There will be a time when it's distinguished between the ones that belong and the ones that don't belong. But in the meantime, you've got to grow among the weeds. That certainly is not to call anybody by name and say, well, you know, I work with some people who are kind of weeds. I, I work with some people that are kind of, it's not that, but we're in this setting that we're scattered among the nations. We're in the mix of a people who don't agree with us, who don't value things the way that we value them, who claim that it's an emergency sometimes when we don't think it's an emergency. Or they'll say, boy, this is really important, and we'll look at it and say, you know, not in the big sense. You know, in the big sense, this is kind of urgent. It needs some attention, but it's not that big a deal. Even the scriptures teach us that even when it comes to death, we view it differently because of the faith that we have in God. That we are blessed are those who mourn, but we don't mourn like those who have no hope. We are scattered among the nations as the church and that's why it's good for us to come together on a weekly basis. And it's good for us to meet around the Lord's table. It's good for us to come out from among them. Again, I'm not trying to be divisive or labeling, but that's the reality of it. It's good for us to come and to encourage one another and to strengthen one another and to love one another because life is hard sometimes. And again, in this context, there are real trials we're going to start in James, uh, we're going to be in James chapter 1, but I want to start in James chapter 3. If you'll turn to James chapter 3, James is talking to these people, again, scattered among the nations, and one of the things he's saying them, to them is that as you are having difficulty, as you are enduring trials in your life, what you need is wisdom. Now, we uh, often think of wisdom maybe as just good old common sense. We have this idea that, you know, some people are smart, but they don't know what they're doing. Uh, they're smart, they're intelligent, but they lack common sense. And we might be tempted to think of wisdom. Wisdom is the application of knowledge. But this distinguishes, James distinguishes here in the third chapter, that there is a wisdom that is of the world. Karen read it for us. And there is a wisdom that is from above. And so people who are intelligent people might look at us and say, you know, it just seems to me common sense that you would approach this problem this way. But our wisdom is not common. It's from above. And again, that passage that Karen read for us, who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show it by his good life, by deeds done in humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy, selfish ambition, 
and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not bow, boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual of the devil. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. But w the wisdom that comes from heaven is, first of all, pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere, peacemakers who sow in peace raise a harvest of righteousness. Now back to chapter 1. I'm going to summarize that maybe a little too simplistically. But when James makes the distinction between worldly wisdom and the wisdom that is from above, Again, oversimplified, but he says that the wisdom that is from above is submissive and it's humble. It acknowledges God and that the wisdom that is from the world involves selfish ambition. This idea of whether or not I am going to be in charge of my life or whether I'm going to acknowledge that there is a God, there is a creator who put all this together and knows how it works. You know, I, it's utilitarian in that sense, that you, you just come from it, uh, come to it and say, it makes sense to me that if God did all this, he knows how it works. He knows how it's supposed to work. And how many times when we put the truth of God into practice, it works. Now, we should do it because he's God. We should do it because we honor him. But the beauty of it is, lots of times it works. Now, you can only you know, uh, be at peace with people who are willing to be at peace with you. Do, do all that you can to be at peace with others. Some people won't do it, but the truth still exists, that God is right. And so we submit ourselves to that. Chapter 1, verse 2, uh, verse 1 we mentioned to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. Verse 2, consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work. Yep, I left my glasses in the truck. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Now, notice this transition. He's going to play on that word, not lacking anything. That if we persevere and we finish what's working in us, be mature and complete. Some of your Bibles will say perfect, not lacking anything. Verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt, because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That man should not think he will receive anything from the Lord. He is double-minded. He is a double-minded man unstable in all he does whenever i see that word lack oftentimes my mind goes to the 23rd psalm the lord is my shepherd i shall not be in want this idea of uh, old testament shalom old testament peace wellness wholeness fullness, not lacking. That's what God desires for his people. That we not have a sense of want. That we not have a sense of emptiness, a sense of lostness, lacking. This insatiable searching for something, for meaning, for purpose, for value, whatever it is, that it means to be lost and we're searching. I just don't have what I want. I, I just don't feel like 
this is all that there should be to life. This sense of emptiness. And when he talks here and says that we should count it as joy because even in trials, even as we are wheat among tares, God is at work in us. God is faithful and he's good and he sees us and he knows our name and he's faithful, he's powerful, he's able. He's not like somebody who loves us and wishes us well. He's somebody who loves us and can change things, can provide things, can make things happen, make things stop happening. And it's that faith that we have, that humility, that we are humbled before God, acknowledging that he is God and I'm not, that his way is right and my way is often not right. This humility that allows us to persevere, that as God works that in us, we become wise. We become more. We become full. Perfect is the word that it's used there. We shy away from that word sometimes. It doesn't mean that we've never made a mistake, but we're not searching. We're not empty. We're not lost because we have found fullness in God. It's the truth that we share oftentimes in marriage ceremonies, that we share with people, that you'll talk and one of the other will say, well, I just don't feel complete without him. I, I just, I feel better because she makes me more than I am. And that relationship that starts off thinking that your spouse is Jesus, that your spouse is somehow going to complete you and make you whole and make you feel better. And in a couple of years, you look up and think, well, they missed. Wow, they, they didn't fix all my problems. They didn't make me better. And that scripture, when it talks about marriage, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and the two, these two individuals who have found wholeness in Jesus Christ, they can come together and be one in Jesus. A half plus a half is just a mess. It doesn't add up spiritually. It is one person and one person being brought together in spiritual union that is the mystery, that is the beauty of marriage. And he's talking here about lacking. And in particular, he says, if you lack wisdom, he gives a simple answer. Ask God. Before you flail around, before you bounce around like those cars, those remote, you know, that just kept spinning around and hitting another wall and spinning around, hitting another wall. Stop. Had a boss that used to say that. He'd walk in and he'd just say, hey, stop the madness. And then he would tell us what we should be doing. We were all floundering around. We weren't being efficient. We weren't being effective. In the same way, have the wisdom to say, I don't have the answer. The answer is not somewhere deep within me that I just need to turn inward and find it. God is God. God is the answer. Prayer is not the last resort. We look to God. Now, one of the misuses of this scripture that I think is critical, and I just want to say it, this is not like that magic eight ball thing that they used to have at the store where you ask it a question and then you turn it up and the little eight-sided dice would tell you uh, whatever the answer would be. This does not mean when you're stuck, say a quick prayer and God will tell you which one you should choose. I can't decide between the red one and the black one and ask God and he'll give you the answer. This actually is much more long-term than that. This is about a lifestyle of asking God. A lifestyle of trusting in God. And it's not just prayer. God does answer prayers. Of course he does. But God has also spoken to us in these last times through his word, through Jesus Christ. And we have the record of that and the testimony of the Holy Spirit in the Bible. So when you say, well, I've prayed and I've prayed and I keep asking God and I'm not getting an answer. Well, you may already have the answer. And it is a lifetime of spending time in God's word that brings us into maturity, that brings us into completion, that gives us the wisdom 
to endure trials and difficulties and hardships. It's not just a quick popcorn prayer that, oh, God, I don't know what it... Now, he may answer that because he's good, but he promises to answer the other one because he's generous. If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God who gives generously, without hesitation. This is a promise. When you ask God, when you continue to knock, when you continue to go back as the uh, parable teaches the, uh, the unjust king where the, the constant repetition of asking, God is going to give you. And then there's that second little tag in there that says, and he doesn't find fault with you. When you come to God and say, God, you're right, and I need the truth, and I need help because raising kids is hard, and leading people in business is hard, and living life and being married and everything is hard. I need wisdom that's not from me, that's from above. It says that God doesn't look at you and say, well, I told you that you were messing up. I told you that you should have known better. As much as you and I are tempted to do that, God doesn't do that. In his perfection and maturity, he gives it generously and without finding fault, the scripture says. It reminds us, I think, clearly of 1 Kings chapter 3. After the reign, the 40-year reign of King David, it comes Solomon's turn. We think of wisdom, we think of Solomon. God comes to Solomon in a dream, says, ask me for what you want. And Solomon says, how can I rule this people? How can I meet the responsibility of my life unless you give me wisdom? He had the example of David, some stumbles, but he had a tremendous leader as a father. They'd had a tremendous expansion and growth under his reign as king. But instead, Solomon says, I don't know how to do. I can't be what you're calling me to be, God, without your help. And so he asked for wisdom. And God, again, being an example of what James says, that when we ask God for wisdom, he gives it generously and without finding fault. God says to him there, it bleeds over into chapter 4 of 1 Kings a little bit. But he says, I'll give you what you ask for. I'll give you the wisdom that you've asked for. But I'm also going to give you the wealth that you didn't ask for. And then he puts the, a condition on the third one. And he says, and I'm going to give you long life. If you want a sermon outline there, I think it's wealth, wisdom, wealth, and welfare. I got it all in W's, but that's a different sermon. That God would give him long life. And I think that's true. Now, does that mean you're going to become fabulously rich if you ask God for wisdom? Not financially. He doesn't always answer it the way that he answered uh, Solomon. That was a specific. But if you continue to ask God for wisdom, if you continue to reach into God's word for truth, people will notice you. People will gravitate to you for help because they'll see that you have something in God that they don't have. They'll recognize that they're lost and you're not. And he talks about that as he moves on here. We're back in James now. He says, if you doubt, if you're double-minded, if you're flailing between trusting in God and trusting in yourself, if you're going back and forth between humility that says, God, you're God, and selfish ambition that says, yeah, but I really think this would be better for me. This is really what I want instead of what you want. He says you're a double-minded man. He, he gives the picture of the ocean. He says you're being tossed by the waves and the wind. Easy way for me to remember that is the current. You know, the current moves in and moves out. You have no anchor in life. When the current's moving in, you drift with it. When the current's moving out, you drift with it. Whatever is currently happening in, in your life, you just flow that way. If it's a good day, you think, wow, I'm winning. If it's a bad day, you think, wow, I'm losing. And you have no anchor. There's nothing stable in your life. How many people do you know? How many times in your life have you experienced instability? 
chaos, just not knowing, and how difficult that is for people who live that every day. How difficult that is for children who are growing up in chaos. They don't have an anchor. They don't have a center point. I remember being in college, and there is no blame or accusation here. I, it was just a realization in my life. I grew up in a house. I had a room. I moved off to college. My mom and dad sold the house and built a new one. And I remember going to visit the new house, the very nice new house. And they were like, you can sleep in that room. But it wasn't my room. It didn't have my stuff. I had been told, my mom watches these, so I'm going to be careful. Um, I had been told after I came home after two weeks of college, if there's anything in that room you want, you better get it. And so I had boxed some things up that I wanted to save, but it was disorienting because I didn't have my room. I didn't have the anchor. I didn't have that one place on earth that I could go back to. And for people who don't have, excuse me, who don't have faith in God, they're not tethered to anything. They're not anchored to anything. And if the current is moving out, they're victim of it. And if the current is moving in, they don't know why, but they know that pretty soon the current's going to start moving back out. And they're just living in this constant instability and chaos that spiritually we think of as lostness. And they're trying to raise kids. And they're trying to pay bills. And they're trying to function in some way and find meaning and purpose and have relationships in their life. And they don't have any center. They don't have any gravity. I hope that that helps us be compassionate. When we see somebody and we think, wow, why are you doing that? Do you not see that that's killing you? Do you not see the impact that that's having on your kids? The answer is no, they don't. Not because they're so evil or not because they're so dumb, but because they don't have an anchor. They don't have this wisdom that comes from above. How do we get that wisdom? God gave it to us. Somewhere along the line, we asked for it. Somewhere along the line, we were humble enough to say, I'm not doing so well. I need a savior. I need some guidance. I need some wisdom. I need some help. And it was in that humility, the opposite of pride, that we cried out for a Savior and found one who is so faithful and generous. The passage here, if you just want to break it down, he says that we're going to go through trials, that life is hard, sin is all around us in the world, we have our own temptations and hardships. We need to ask for godly wisdom. And we need to believe that God is able and willing to help us. And as temptation comes to us, we need to fight double-mindedness. We need to rest in the fact that God is good, that God knows what is best. There is humility. The result of humility is wisdom. And the result of wisdom is a life without lacking this single-minded trust in God this passage is addressed to those who belong to God who are scattered among the nations now we might ask that well why is that we might be like Jesus's disciples and say well wouldn't it just be better to go ahead and yank it all up and sort it all out now but God loves those weeds. Jesus died for those weeds, those who are without anchor, and this scripture says, without hope. And he's left us as servants. He's left us as missionaries and evangelists and neighbors and friends to reach out to those around us. A lot of people recognize that they're lost. A lot of people recognize that there's chaos in their lives. They just don't know what to do about it. They don't know where to turn. 
So they watch a TV program or they buy a bottle of this or that or they reorganize their closet. But it just doesn't make it any better. And so this wisdom that is not of ourselves but is of God, this humility that the Holy Spirit has enabled us to have in our hearts to ask God to share the truth, the love of a God who generously gives to all who ask without condemning, without finding fault. Let's stand. And let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this good day. We thank you for your word, for the truth that we find in it, for the connection that we find, Lord, between our life and what this book says, that we can see the reality of these truths all around us, that people are lost. Lord, we give you thanks for your great mercy towards us, for the help and the blessing uh, that you have given to us in our lives, for a peace that passes understanding, for joy, for the ability to love and to be loved. Lord, we ask your blessing upon us today. We ask that your Holy Spirit would work in us to cause your will to be done. Lord, search us, know us, help us to know ourselves that we might see if there's any unclean way in us. We're thankful for Jesus, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. Let's sing.